Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, world. We are very happy again to be here. And this is an awesome planet. And we feature awesome people. And I have with me, perhaps she will be the youngest awesome personality we're featuring here because she has very many special skills and stories to tell us. And mostly they will be in the photos that she will show us. So that's the hint already, Kathy. Kathy belongs to a photography uh, field, very famously led by her father, John Chua, whom we miss, and Harvey Chua. So let me introduce to you now, none other than from Netherlands, Kathy Chua Grime. Hello, Kathy. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> yeah. um, How's everything? First of all, I heard, like, oh, oh wait. great, great. Where are you in Netherlands? Because some people might just be watching from there. Uh, I'm in Vodiksveen. Where is that? Um, it's an hour south of Amsterdam, an hour north of Rotterdam, uh, in that area. Okay. It's a beautiful. The, it's a beautiful city. Is it still winter there, or has it started to be spring and tulip time? Uh, well, because it's April 1, we have snow. Huh? It's Still? snow for the first time in the winter. Well, it's now spring. Oh, okay. Anyway, all right. Cool. So, um, as I said, uh, the, the audience of Awesome Planet would also be Gen Xers, in which you are a very, very uh, a deep set member of that generation, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Gen X. And so, yeah, yeah. That so it will, be easy. it will be easy for you to relate to them rather than me being a dinosaur. But uh, having known you for the longest time and uh, being very proud of you still with how you have uh, managed to, to shift from uh, the Philippines to Netherlands from being a hockey player, photographer, and everything else to a mom and wife then you'll have to tell us your story. So Kathy, start with your story on um, how you started in um, photography or, okay. I wanna say thank you first. I wanna say thank you first for having me here because the first time you asked me if we could do a story, I said, sure, but then you said culinary DNA and I said, are you kidding? So um, I wanted to, you know, at that time between um, your email, and, and now I've had time to think about what it means uh, to have culinary DNA. And mm -hmm. I told you, okay, neither of my parents are known for their cooking. Mm -hmm. Why would you ask for my story? And I realized that, you know, my entire family, we actually all love food, but we all love food in different ways. Yep. So I was very intimidated at first to be in the show with you because you're you food stylist extraordinaire, and with Anton, I used to read his blogs. So who and am I, I Deva? I'm your, I think I'm your average home cook um, because I struggle to figure out what my entire family will eat for well, dinner being, each day. That, being, that wait, didn't I think, appear in the menu the week before. <laughs> wait, being moved from the Philippines to Netherlands and being moved from uh, eating in a studio to cooking your own meals and serving food to um, the Dutch. That's already a developing, a development in your culinary DNA, but please proceed. So, but I'm very happy to uh, say that, okay, even if I'm not an intuitive cook, uh, if I freestyle things, it can only go one of two ways. It can go really well and the dish is fantastic or it could go spectacularly wrong. Uh, I have under my belt the distinction of being able to produce something that is both burnt and raw at the same time. <laughs> but, you know, that's why I'm, I'm glad that there are recipes online and out there so I can follow it and, and we still have friends and we're still alive. We the have those things. things. Oh, we have we, well, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that you reassured me that the love for food is enough because apparently it is. Yes. Looking back okay. on my life, one of those things. 
So, so but before that, tell, tell me first, um, tell me first about your photography and the, your life in in Manila. And hi, Harvey. Okay. Um, if you put in the first picture, I can show you. Uh, okay. So you want us to have the photos already? Okay, that's good. Show me. Show us. Okay, I grew up here. The okay. uh, photo of the building, that's our house and studio. Long before this COVID thing happened, my parents did work from home. So I grew up with um, this entire setup where there were lots and lots of people. And, you know, we, I grew up with you. That's, shall we say, how long ago? Um, you grew up with uh, agency people, advertising and people, food stylists. Yes, and and I think food shoots were like the most interesting because they had like the nice mix between activity and people. Uh, there was enough activity to keep everyone interested. Well, a child like me interested. Interested. I remember one of my first memories of a shoot was uh, ice cream. And back then, not a lot of people knew how to make uh, fake ice cream. So they were shooting with real ice cream. And the food stylist would really very carefully scoop a ball. And then they would put it on the set. And because the lights are warm, it would melt. And as soon as it melts past optimal, they'll say, who wants ice cream? And as a seven-year-old, you fall in line, right? <laughs> <laughs> so okay. that was really fun. And then so, right. and then How and about this one? do you want to know? No, do you want to know my favorite memory of you in the no, studio? No, 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 no. The, the story is not about me. The story is about you. No, well, the story is okay, but the story is about me watching you, calling all yeah, of these fruits and vegetables heroes. So there's this respect for good quality ingredients, and then you're there concentrating on this hamburger bun. I said, Nancy, what are you doing? I'm making a hero. And then you carefully took your tweezers and you got the sesame seeds and then you attached it to the bun with super glue. And <laughs> after then, you learned to ask, is this edible? Because sometimes it's delicious. Sometimes it's varnish. Yep. So, <laughs> but it's, it, it's always been like an interesting activity to see okay um what what goes on behind the scenes the other yeah. thing is in advertising the the hours are long we we work long hours sometimes we work, work for days mm -hmm. um my parents believed in good food especially for the staff we didn't want them to have to worry about what they were going to have for lunch or to have to prepare it uh before coming to work yeah. So they believed in in-house meals. Yep. And right? we loved it. And we, we loved it. and we also shared this with the clients. Honest to goodness food. So it had to be really good because when when the food is good, it helps with motivation. It helps with yeah. satisfaction. It, it it it's just it's nice to have a good meal when you're tired. Okay. So. All right. The clients used to say, if the bids were kind of the same, they'd come to us because the food is good. And really... yeah. <laughs> that's a good secret. Okay, going oh, down, had... down, going down. Uh, what what's this all about? Is this a studio? Yes. So that that picture at the bottom uh, with a tilting platform that you see, that's a yes. that's what a shoot looks like. Uh huh. So could you imagine being small and walking around all of these lights and all of these people? When was the you first time you lot. held a camera, Kathy? When was the first time you held a real honest to goodness camera? Uh, I was 10. My dad liked uh, hanging out in uh, Fort Santiago because they had photography lessons and he liked talking to budding photographers. So he mm -hmm. enrolled me in the basic class four times 
<laughs> so that he can <laughs> hang out with his friends. Okay. All right. And then uh, after that, did you take up photography already as a business, as a career? Uh, at 10, no, but eventually I did. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I, I was really inspired by you and the other food stylists. I thought I wanted to become a chef. Um, uh -huh. And But when I was filling up my college application, I was also interested in like travel and adventure. And, and my dad said, oh, you know, if you become a photographer, you could also be a food stylist on the side or you could go out on your adventures. It's something that you could mix with like all sorts of things. So I, uh, I became a photography major. Okay. Uh, are and, all these yeah, shots, are, are these uh, all your shots or uh, no, the no, shots no, no. of your this, company? Uh, this is the ad photo portfolio. The industrial shots are mine. Uh, there are some of the food shots, but Jeannie mm -hmm. and my dad uh, photographed uh, most of these ones. Okay. Let's go to the next one. All right. Okay, what's the story of this? See, you remember I said I wanted to be a chef, Sana. Mm -hmm. um, in, in high school, my cousin, Honey, she taught me how to bake cookies. And she was selling these cookies in school. And I'm just like, wow, you know, that's a great way for me to like make extra pocket money. So this mm -hmm. is my failed sideline that mm -hmm. became my lifeline because uh -huh. I baked the batch. I put okay. it in a jar, I put it in the shop, and I was going to sell them to our clients. But my dad was so proud because these cookies were nice. And he said, oh, here, try one, try one. And I said, wait, <laughs> how about my sales? And he's like, no, Kathy, you cannot charge separately for cookies. <laughs> we're, a, <laughs> we're an advertising photography studio. So I renegotiated my allowance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then decided to just, you know, bake cookies for uh, fun. And you know what he realized? He said, the, when I was in college already and I was taking up photography, I wanted to photograph uh, my favorite rock band. And I was a little bit nervous and all of that. And he, my dad said, bring cookies. It's a, it's a really good icebreaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I brought cookies. I brought cookies for the band. I brought cookies for the bouncers. I brought cookies every time I was there because it was a, it was a good way to like introduce yourself. And then I would take photos and then I would give those photos to like the management and collect some also for my photojournalism class. So you made more, and, you, you made money selling uh, no. or, or no. you just became popular? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so so no, I did not make. I've never made money on cookies, <laughs> but you, so anyway, you so, me, so you, you told me you have, a, you told me you have a story about cookies. Why is it was very significant in in your life in your story? I'm getting there. So okay. anyway, so here's the thing. Um, I so I brought the so I was photographing this band right and, and the cookies, and then one night the crowd behind me was getting quite rowdy. And the bouncer picked me up, put me behind him. And I was just like, thanks, pare. And he was just like, yeah, if you get hurt, nobody's going to bring us cookies anymore. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, cookies have saved my life. Thank you. And then, uh -huh. and then, and then the album came out. And then now my claim to fame. It says, and it said, to Kathy Chua, thanks for the cookies. You know, I was there to do a photo document. Should have been a premonition. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I got out of college and then um, I became I became a professional photographer. But hang on, going back to these cookies, you know, the clients like them. Uh, and so even before I joined uh, Ad Photo Full Force, we, we were giving away these cookies as corporate giveaway. And uh -huh. then in 2017, the last time I made it for Ad Photo, we made close to 6,000 cookies in three days. What what cookies pala? What cookies are they? Bra chocolate, chip. chocolate chocolate chip. Okay, and what's this? Uh, what pie is this? Oh, that's apple pie. That's my father-in-law's recipe. That's a okay. later edition. But so uh, anyway. Okay. So these cookies, I've I've learned my dad when I go to a shoot and I'm especially when I'm a little bit nervous or if I'm meeting them for the first time. 
bring them, it's a good icebreaker. Or bring them, it's a nice way to say thank you. So, you know, throughout the years, I do photography and bring cookies. And it's nice because until now, clients still remember, they remember the shoots, but they also remember the cookies. And that's, that it feels good. Okay. So the cookies were your passport to many things. Well, the cookies, I think, became like a, like a, not my mom's signature, but you know, it was, it, it, yeah, it helped. It helped make people comfortable. It helped make me comfortable. It helped okay. make things memorable. All right. Okay. We go to the next one. All right. You shot these? Yes. Those are mine. So I became, I graduated from uh, school, from university, and I became a professional photographer. Mm -hmm. And I shot uh, food and products and talents. But, you know, I fell in love with industrial photography. Okay. Very good. Because it was like being on Discovery Channel. Sorry? It was like being on Discovery Channel. Uh -huh. was, yeah, you know, it's like watching. But, you know, when you go on uh, like an industrial, in an industrial environment, you're not photographing models. So people yeah. have to be kind of comfortable with you because if people aren't comfortable, it shows in the pictures. Uh -huh. You can see... Yeah that people are a little tense, they're looking over their shoulder, they're second guessing um, their actions, or, you know, they're a little bit wary now, okay, what, what, what should I do? And that's when I realized that, like, the cookies kind of helped, because then you're not just, oh, I'm just a photographer, and the photographer's there. You become Kathy, right? Uh, the friend, the colleague, the whatever. And my dad, you know, he, he, he also liked doing industrial photography. And when I was doing this project for, for this company, I had started with uh, their livelihood programs. Mm -hmm. So we were going around the Philippines, basically, uh, taking pictures of micro businesses and normally when you're doing a shoot like that you don't have a whole lot of time to um, sit down and set up I realized that even with with the the people that we were the subjects that we were photographing having merienda with them like having a snack with them helps them also feel more comfortable okay. so they would bring out uh merienda palitao which is uh like a rice cake the one on one of the shoots uh we needed to photograph farmers at seven o'clock in the morning and they came and they were carrying with them um these pots with boiled sabah which is banana and they're just like do you think we prepared this for you we walked seven kilometers and you know i wanted to cry because the you could tell that they valued us being there to photograph them. And that's when I knew that I really wanted to work with this company. So I worked really hard. And then one day they said, um, and then one day they said, do you want to shoot offshore? Do you want to shoot industrial? And I said, yes, because my dad had photographed that lower part, the concrete gravity structure. Um, years before but he had never this, seen the is it this one is it this one this one on the yeah so this one on the platform that bottom part my dad photographed okay. that one uh -huh. and so All it right. was his dream it was his dream to go offshore and 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 he was kind of he was really proud that i got the assignment and i worked for years that was my dream my dream was to be able to take him offshore and I worked for years so that I would be their go-to photographers and they wouldn't need to look anywhere else. Um, and I worked really hard. Because okay. it's nice to have a goal, right? 
And then yeah. I knew, and then I would bring cookies, right? So that people would be comfortable with me. And then I knew they were comfortable with me when one day, uh, when we were landing on the heli deck announcement was, the cookies are here. <laughs> so I, okay. I love that, you know, okay. okay. <laughs> They're comfortable. And, and that is the, that's, that's the photo that I would like to you to describe. That is the offshore, right? Yeah, so that is when I dared to ask, hey, you know, do you think for the next assignment, do you think I can send my dad? And mm -hmm. that is my dream come true. And it was such a proud moment because normally when we're being introduced, I get introduced as Kathy, the daughter of the John Chua. When he uh -huh. went offshore, he was being introduced as, oh, this is Kathy's dad. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It was a reverse introduction. <laughs> yeah. And this yeah. is the premier advertising photographer of the Philippines yes. being introduced as Kathy. And you remember Kathy who brings the cookies, that one. <laughs> and, yeah. So how long did you, uh, how, how did you shoot from the helicopter? Wala pan drone I, no? No, there were no drones yet. Oh, I you probably can't use a drone there either. Um, you were the drone. <laughs> Well, before in the man before drones, we would be shooting from from helicopters or from cranes or con towers. Uh -huh. I, you know, it it I guess it was also part prestige. I liked being an industrial photographer because there weren't very many, and plus I was girl, and it was kind of surprising sometimes. Because mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and. Okay. You know, it was it was really and the food offshore is fantastic. It's the best food for miles around. All right. It's like the ad photo buffet, but with an international twist. They have <laughs> steak. Okay. You know, when All people right. are on rotation, you kind of have to keep them happy. That's and a very food. nice father and daughter photo. But we move. I love this one. Okay, we're now into another phase of your life, and uh, definitely you did not shoot this. But who who is that couple in the jeepney? I this okay so this was photographed by my dad's friend joel uh garcia and uh that's my john we all married that was your wedding that was your wedding yes. where yes uh, this one is in tagaytay okay <laughs> um and i met john offshore on assignment so i fell in love with industrial photography and I fell in love on assignment. I asked my client first whether it was okay because, you know, it's kind of hard with uh, conflict of interest and stuff like that. What does John do? What <laughs> they said, John... it's okay. Uh, he's he no, John is a, he's a safety, he's a safety uh, engineer. Oh, wow. Yeah. So right. that's why, that's why he was hanging from the jeepney as a safety engineer. <laughs> <laughs> no, he did that because he loved me. So I'm like, oh, it'll be a nice photo. Let's, let's be a little nice. daring. Love that. I love that. Um, but you know, okay, so John Laman, John's Dutch. Well, that's why we're here. Um, <laughs> but he apparently is powered by rice. Because, you know, he, he loved Lumpiang Shanghai. Chicken adobo. My dad used to call him Shanghai boy. Shanghai <laughs> now. <laughs> he would stand right, and then he'd eat with his ceiling labuyo and his. He knows how to make his own salsa, and so I'm very proud of him. So after five years of going out, um, it wasn't hard to convince him to move to the Philippines after we got married. We're really lucky that he found a job um, in the Philippines, and he's really, you know. It, it it was really nice that he was open to it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know, it was only actually when, when John moved to Manila that I learned how to kind of cook every day. Because you remember in Bautista, we had like a, in Ad Photo, we had a full-time cook. But... After we got married, John and I decided, okay, we're going to start a like a family, and I, we kind of decided that I would focus on the family because it's, you know, it's hard to be pregnant and an industrial photographer. You you're not going to fit in the, <laughs> in the the ladder. The ladder has a cage. 
<laughs> and so, they may not harness you. <laughs> right, you know, the, the, the straps are gonna be a little bit hard when you're nine months pregnant. So, um, uh, so we decided I was gonna stay at home and, and I would focus on, on raising the kids and all of that. So I had time to learn how to cook. And then we had like new, we, so we would be entertaining our friends and then we would have um, new expat friends, people who are also kind of looking for people to hang out with because they've just moved. Mm -hmm. And it was so nice to hear them ask, so how do you cook Filipino food? Because they could go to their choice of restaurant, but they uh -huh. wanted to learn how to cook it themselves. Are there are and, there many Filipino restaurants in your area? Uh, for as far as I know, there's two. Oh, it's a, okay. about an hour away. Um, okay. But so this is in Manila. And when they asked me, oh, how do you cook this dish? And I didn't know because if I wanted to eat Filipino food, I would go home and eat at the Ad Photo Buffet or I would go out to a restaurant. So I bought a few Filipino cookbooks. And I started learning how to cook Filipino food. I mean, mm -hmm. I could do adobo and caldereta. That, that was it. But, you know, it took somebody else's interest in our cuisine to push me to learn about it in earnest. Good. And so That's by the good. time we moved here, you know, we're kind of, we're, well, plus there was a spate where I was panic cooking. We lived in Filipino food. Well, we lived in the Philippines for seven years. And you know, despite everything, they were really wonderful years. But John's contract, well, then I I got sick. You can move on to the next picture. I'll okay. show you. I got sick. I was diagnosed with a really rare kind of cancer in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids and you already, had, you already had these two kids. Did you, how many kids do you have? Just the two? I have two, two. Kids? I right. have two kids. So uh, at the time that I was diagnosed, they were uh, turning two and three. Mm -hmm. And for months, nobody, uh, well, nobody knew what it was. It was because we had to go to the U.S. to get the biopsy done. Okay. Because it's the, one of those, it was a blood vessel lining cancer, which is, it. you need a dictionary to, to figure out what it was. But anyway, so cooking became my form of stress relief. Because mm -hmm. when your mind is clouded already, you're like, ah. Oh. You're like, oh, hi, let's bake. Uh -huh. So uh, our, you shaved uh, your head because that was uh, you were you had to undergo chemo or something. Uh, well, the hair fell out and I shaved it before I did that because I didn't mm -hmm. want to clean up the floor. Okay. And also, I didn't want to shock the kids with it falling out in clumps. So we shaved it before. I'm glad that you know on the days that I couldn't, but I couldn't cook. I didn't have the energy anymore to to do so. Um, John would take over the cooking, which mm -hmm. is fantastic because, you know, sometimes you just, you don't have the energy. And this cake, um, I could do cookies, but the cakes were a little bit beyond my energy capacity. So my mom's friend, uh, Tita Agnes, she sent us uh, like a cake that I could just decorate with my kids. And mm -hmm. it became like a fun activity, baking and making cookies and, and decorating cakes became a fun activity for us when on the days that I couldn't, I couldn't leave the house because I was too tired or I was immunocompromised. But here's the thing. Do you remember those cookies? I brought yeah. it to every doctor's appointment, every, um, yeah, the scan, I, I, I even brought it to the OR. I brought apple <laughs> pies because, you know, I was nervous. Mm -hmm. And I was, sometimes I was scared. And when you, and, and most of the time I wanted to, to say thank you. When you give the nurses cookies, they, they have this smile on their face. 
And that mm -hmm. smile makes you smile back even bigger. And it's so amazing how such a small gesture could have such a big impact on my healing. So everywhere I went, people were kind of smiling. They were looking forward to uh, having us over. I was looking forward. I mean, no matter how much pain I was in, I was looking forward to going to the doctors or the nurses so that I could give them cookies. It was how young a mother were you then? How how young a mother I, were you when your cancer I was? was I was uh, the first time it hit. I was thirty six. Hmm, very young. Yeah, I was thirty six. You know, and it was then, nice to go into the OR. This picture actually with the pies in the bed. That was the second time already. They rolled uh -huh. me into the OR. And the doctor said, Kathy, you brought apple pie, <laughs> which is kind of like a more comforting intro than good morning, Mrs. Grimm, you're here for an amputation, right? So it was so, an amputation. Uh, the second time around, okay. I was lucky enough. I was really lucky to be able to have an amputation. So um, what I was just saying is it, it's such a small gesture, a small box of cookies it's okay. gone in 10 minutes but yeah. the, it's a lifelong it, it forms a bond it breaks the ice yeah and i that, think i think i i think that it's a good it's a good example for people to follow what you did not not yeah. even just for uh when going to the hospital but in many different ways you know you always have a cookie to give that became your kathy factor but let's move yeah. on so this was you were in the hospital and this was the amputation i'm sorry to ask oh, well, this yes. is like two different no this was the, there are two different pictures happening here um okay the first one with my kids being small that was the first round we were still in manila uh -huh. and then the second round was uh the second one, round i fought here already it came back uh oh. hopefully never again i it won't don't worry okay We'll just Amen. be vigilant. Okay. Can we can um, we move on now? Wait. All right. So, ah, it's nice to meet ah, the family. There are my kids. So <laughs> after um after my first round with cancer, my dad had a round two and uh he uh migrated to heaven. <laughs> so we decided it was time for us to also just to have a change of environment. John's contract had ended. I said, where are we gonna go? And I said, okay, you know, um, I would like for the kids to learn about their Dutch heritage. So let's move back to the Netherlands because we, we couldn't extend his contract anymore in the Philippines, uh -huh. right? So we moved, we moved to the Netherlands uh, four years now, this April. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was, boy, what an adventure. I, I've always liked the Netherlands anyway. So, okay. yeah. Let's what go, let's go for it. I, Your daughters uh, are? So my Gabby and Alexa? Gabby and Alexa. Yeah. Alexa, say hello. <laughs> hmm, okay. Right? So anyway, no, I don't it was really interesting because my kids, when we moved, they were four and five. They had gone from coming home from school and having like lunch in Bautista because we, we lived in Ad Photo for a year uh, mm -hmm. before moving because I wanted to spend time with my parents uh, before migrating. And uh, so they moved for, from coming home from school and having lunch rice and mungo and adobo to having lunch in school. Mama, what's this? It's a sandwich, Anak. <laughs> I had to teach them how to eat bread because they would have bread, but it was a, like a side dish with a pasta. And, but, uh. you know, it was, it was interesting. Or we all had to find like our new favorites. Um, they in school they used to drink these small tetra tetra packs called mm -hmm. Dutch mill. 
Yeah. Apparently, it's not a Dutch brand. <laughs> so we went to Holland. And, and there's no Dutch mill. <laughs> but it's okay. So they found their, their new their new favorites. And here they don't sell thing. They don't sell one piece only. So when you're finding your new favorite tetra packs, you buy them in six pieces. And if they're not quite a hit, John and I have would have to drink it because it's sayang. Um, <laughs> but thankfully, yeah, chocolate milk is a chocolate hit as a milk. Uh, sorry, chocolate milk was a hit. And they really love that. Uh, Dutch kids have chocolate sprinkles for breakfast. It's called Huggles So okay. uh, They would have stuff on toast. That was the fastest way we got them to eat bread, chocolate sprinkles. So now they eat bread. <laughs> so happy. <laughs> but and they still found... like kanin. They still like kanin. Yeah, they they kanin rice. Their comfort <laughs> food is still, still Filipino. And we're really glad that um, there's a fairly good Filipino community here. We have a local ice cream brand called Luneta. They make really? Luneta? Yeah, they make really nice ube ice cream and mm. cheese and mango. The flavors that we had from home, makapuno, we can find here by a Filipino but also Dutch company. It's and made then, there? It's made there? Yes. We oh, even wow. have, interview them. We even have a Filipino style hot dog. There's two brands that sell them. And to see, we're going to live. And then we found a, a Filipino store uh, called Toko for All, and they sell Lechon Kawali and <laughs> they sell Tonrig Light, which is my every now and then uh, nice treat, especially if you're eating with banana leaves. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay. you know, all of the stuff we were able to find. But, you know, also, Dutch food is, is wonderful, actually. You don't hear a lot about it, but they have really nice, comforting food, especially in the it's winter, like, my favorite. It's like German, German food? Is it like German food? It's very, um, yes and no, uh, like the stews. Uh -huh. The flavor profile is a little bit different, but in the winter, when you're sitting down, they'll have like a mashed potato with uh, like bits of bacon and apple. Yeah. And you serve it with, together, mashed, right? They're, they're like the kings of mashed potatoes. Uh-huh, yeah. Every different time. Shut up, yeah. right? And then Can they'll have... Them. The, yeah, no, the kartoffel is German. Art apple oh, is, is uh, these... Dutch. Art uh, apple. Okay. It, it's very, they're, from what I've tried and what I've cooked, it's very homey. They'll have parang stews that have um, juniper, and it's just this mix of their history. It's, mm -hmm. And then they'll have strope waffles, which is my favorite, actually, and okay. cheese. So yeah. we're glad that we also moved here. <laughs> okay, next. All right. Ah, this one. So when we moved, uh, normally when we invite our new Dutch friends over, they're curious to find out what Filipino food is like. Mm -hmm. Because here, they have a really strong Indonesian influence, understandably. Yes, yes. But Filipino food is, well, not as known because well first of all i'm when i moved to one x vein i was one of six filipinos you uh -huh. can see the size of our market here but this photo was a uh, from a presentation that i did from a i joined a multicultural women's group and they asked us to they asked me to do a presentation to the philippines and i wanted to showcase our food because how do filipinos say hello we say uh -huh. uh, or welcome, which is fine. Um, I challenged myself to make as many rice dishes as I could. And then I realized I had to translate all of it. So how do you translate putok chinta, bibingka, suman, palitao 
into Dutch. I mean, even if you translate it to English, it's all rice cake. Uh -huh. yeah. So I realized that the descriptions of how it's cooked um, is better than trying to make literal translations. And so now every time we entertain, we have like a small menu describing okay. the food and how it's cooked. And that's really helped introduce um, our new friends to Filipino cuisine. And, you know, it's, it's nice because they, they don't really know what to expect. Um, they'll say, oh, you know, is it spicy? And we're just like, oh, well, it's not as spicy as so-and-so other cuisine, right? Adobo works. Thanks they like the it. They yes. like it. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it, yeah, it's a, caldereta is also a very familiar uh, profile, like a taste. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. I, I'm not too sure about bagoong. Uh, I've only tried once. <laughs> mm -hmm. But so they uh, like yeah. That. Okay, well, well like the so in a, in a way that was uh, your your culinary DNA was evolving um, more so when you were already in in your in Netherlands. Let's see the next ones. Oh, this is already oh about your um, this this is you right? So okay, so uh, I think a year after we moved, my cancer came back, and this time, you know, I we weren't sure if how it was going to go it it was it was really fast so i was kind of i was really lucky that um after the sixth round of chemo they said hey you know we can go for an amputation which meant that i had a chance to live and i was like yeah you know go for it so we did that and uh and i flooded the Dutch healthcare system with cookies because <laughs> I was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, How is, it, is, it, is it heavy? It's heavy metal or is it graphite or something? Is it heavy to walk, walk with? Uh, yes, it takes me more energy to walk. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and then, and then I, uh, and then I had to go through rehab. Because I had to learn how to walk. You had to relearn how to walk. It, mm -hmm. it walks differently. Uh -huh. So rehab, they asked me, what's your dream? And I was like, oh, I want to hike down to Pambulo, which is a remote village in the in the rice areas, like uh, in, in Ifugao, one of my dad's favorite oh, this villages. One. This yeah, one. that was um, when I finished my first round of cancer. And after my dad passed away, I took his ashes to that village because it was one of his favorites. I used to hear stories. It was my first time and people said, oh, you know, don't go. It's like a hard hike. And they said, no, 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 you know, I have to do this. I want to know that I can do stuff that normal people do. Well, or, you know, that I can, that I can, that I can, because I was limping, right? So now my dream is to climb back down there, even with a prosthetic, because I want to know for myself that I can. I will challenge myself. And it is still a dream. But COVID's kind of make it, made it hard to uh, travel to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting here two years. Uh, COVID happened just after I got out of rehab. Oh. So I'm sitting here, but I'm two years itching to prove to myself that I can. Okay. Last year, my friend said, want to go to Dusseldorf. <laughs> and at this point, I was uh, watching uh, K-dramas and, and listening to K-pop like half the world. So I was watching, you know, I was, I'd watch all these shows and they would have food that I had never, that I was interested in. They, you know, you'd always see them eating Korean fried chicken and then beer or, you know, I can't even pronounce it because I can only read the subtitles. The, those jokboki jok was nice. 
I mean, well, how does it taste? I don't know. I've only seen it on TV. So I'm like, okay, why don't we go to Dusseldorf? And I was also looking for like good ramen and stuff. Dusseldorf, there's a street there called Immermannstrasse. And that is like the center of little Tokyo. And they are home to like a really big Korean and Japanese community. So Shebra, I'm like, I'm wondering, can I do it? Um, I've never been without my family, without John. I've never traveled. And I'm an above the knee amputee, so can I will I make it? Bahalana, let's go. The calling of fried chicken is strong. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I hauled my suitcase across four trains on like a two and a half hour trip to my first out of town, Brilliant. out of the country adventure okay. for food. Who knew? Who knew that food would be the motivation to walk? It takes me more energy. Uh, it takes to to walk than like a, than the average person. But for being Sue, we will keep up. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so uh, who's so the one far, here? Who is this? This is you. That's my friend. That's that's me. You can see, I'm still wearing the same clothes from the train station. Um, mm -hmm. That's my friend Mania. She lives in Switzerland. Uh -huh. So we met there. Okay. Travel alone, talaga. Can you see? Like, I don't know if you can see my hair. It's a little bit still of a mess. Because <laughs> yeah, straight really. from the train station, straight from the train station to the Bingsu shop. And then, oh. you know, and it's nice because so far, like the trips that I'm, that I've planned, uh, the solo trips and all right. are all, but I'm, oh, let's try this. When we did that, I came home. My pasalubong for my kids was, I was so inspired by the food that I tried there that the Korean fried chicken is now on a rotation. Food apparently is your best pasalubong because it, it's amazing. It's a multi-sensory experience that takes you to other places as well as takes you back in time. And if you learn how to cook it, you can have it every, every other week. Not even every week. Okay. So, <laughs> so what, what, are the, what are the dishes that you normally would call a special dish that you can cook now in Netherlands, Filipino or Dutch, whatever? Uh, so I can make Drudge's Place for the Dutch. But, What's that? And my Drudge's Place. What's that? It's a stew with uh, juniper and cloves and um, cinnamon. Uh -huh. And um, it also has like onions. And then my teacher, uh, my language class teacher taught me how to add uh, on bite cook, which is a spiced cake, which is how they did it in their family. Um, one of my friends introduced me to hate a blixem, which is the, it's called hot lightning. And that's the potato with, uh, with the apples and the, the bacon, mm -hmm. um, for Filipino dishes. Yeah. We'll do the, like the rotation adobo, caldereta, laing. My Mania, the friend that I traveled with to Dusseldorf, she taught me uh, European adjusted laing. How? Oh, what is European adjusted laing? Spinach? Yes. Okay. And uh, not as many pieces of ceiling labuyo. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay. So uh, those are the photos we have. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I, I think you're right. People have, I thought that to be a foodie, you needed to be some technical no. cook, some, but it's just the love and food for me, it's my language of love. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Cookie. glad that I can do this for my kids. Cookies was the Kathy factor in, uh, in yeah. our connected. But you know, I think you know people can get by with a smile. I just I, I bake when I'm nervous, so and I can't eat all of the cookies that I bake. So, all right. So where are you more comfortable now in uh, in cooking? Back home in the Philippines or 
back there in your new home. Uh, I think I'm comfortable here. Um, not that I was uncomfortable back in Manila. In Manila, we could entertain a lot. We also had like help in the kitchen. Uh, yeah. So here you have to clean, clean as you go. Yeah. Because because uh, if you don't, you either clean up now or you clean up later. <laughs> Okay. And um, did your did your did your being an amputee um, make life difficult for you adjusting there to the physical work that you had to do? I'm I'm just so grateful that I'm alive. That I can't complain if it's a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. Um. Sure, there are some things that would have been easier with both legs, but it's a lot easier now than it was when we weren't sure if I was going to make it. Happy to be alive. Happy to be able to go out and take trips to X, Y, and Z, or even just to be with my family. That was funny. That was one of the milestones that I had in rehab. That it was first time to cook on my own. I sent them a video of me walking around the kitchen. It was a milestone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I've had this as a motivation. You know, it literally, I think it's changed my life. And I'm glad that you pushed me a little bit in that direction, that you were inspiring enough for me to be interested when I was a child. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you had so much energy that you wanted to be 10 things in uh, at, all at the same time, a hockey player, a photographer, uh, taking care of your beautiful black dog and being of course volunteering to the zoo stylist and everything and uh no what i admire most and i think what um the gen xers who are listening now is uh how you made that decision it's like when you said when you were telling your story you said oh yeah let's go let's do it i mean was it just like that that easy for you uh, to do lose a part of your leg or something and or better or, one legged than dead We're, yeah well, the I, option. you know um it it all had to do with um the attitude you have so you know like um i would think did uh photography because photography is uh like life imitating art or art imitating life right and i think when you were exposed to that you knew what reality was, but it was it became a little more poetic or more beautiful. That's why that's why I would think that uh, you you did not really dwell on the uh, what will happen. I can't walk. I'll feel ugly or these things, and you know uh, people will look at me strange and all that. See, so uh. what, what I'm driving at is. How will you be a how how what would you like to share now with the Gen Xers, uh, in in the very inspiring story that you have being a young mom, until now you're still young. Well, I wanted to live. That's all. That, that was the bottom line. I think I spent months and months wondering if I was going to die and what it was going to be like with, for my kids. I I had to prepare them for the for the possibility that I would not be around. Uh, I was teaching them how to bake their favorite cakes and cookies, knowing that they might not remember it, uh -huh. right? Uh, and making all these videos because what if things go wrong? So by the time the doctor said, you know, an amputation is possible, it was the miracle that we were praying for. You don't think anymore, oh, am I going to be ugly? I don't care, I'm not gonna be dead, that's for sure. <laughs> so, um, 
And, you know, with, with, with walking around with a prosthesis and especially going to, you know, all these rest, I'm, I survived. There's nothing to be ashamed of. So, you know, people would look at me and, you know, I figured if people can sense your attitude towards things. Mm-hmm. So I'd walk around the Hague and people would stop me because I'm walking around like, like I'm having a day out with my girlfriends, which is I was. And I said, how can you, I'm happy. That's so cool. it doesn't matter. I, I didn't want a prosthesis that, sh- that uh, looked like a real egg. Yeah. I want yeah. people to see that, okay, look, if I can do this, then you can, you can follow your dreams too. With the little help of the cookies, huh? Anyway, even before that, before that, when you when John was still uh, around, I know that you had certain advocacies, especially the one of the Manila Zoo. So you know, uh, people, the audience uh, in Manila um, are now. I think I heard that the Manila Zoo has been refurbished, re- renovated, beautified, and all. But what was your involvement there? Uh, I started volunteering for the zoo in uh, 1998, 99. Mm-hmm. Uh, a friend of mine and I, Kitty, and I, we co-founded um, my zoo volunteer group. And then, of course, my dad, being a supportive dad, said, I'll help. You know, and he, uh, he fell in love with an elephant. The yeah. only one in the Philippines. <laughs> What's the name of the elephant? The one and only Mali. elephant. Yeah. Huh? The one and only elephant, Mali. Mavi? So, Mali? Mali. Mali. Mali, this yeah. Mali. Is Mali so still alive? Him, Would you yeah, know? Yes. If Mali and is... she, has a beautiful, wow. she has a beautiful new enclosure. How, how old is Mali, is Mali now? Probably about 50. Wow. Oh, well, anyway, they live a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, Were you able and, to get and, you know, you know, and, and Yeah, and he gave her the best mangoes that he could find. And I said, you know, if you gave me mangoes like that, I'd listen to you too. Because <laughs> he, he that they were really close. So anyway, and then, um, yeah, and then we became really close with uh, people with in Manila Zoo, like the whole zoo volunteer group. You know, they have really awesome barbecue. Mm-hmm. That's ours. Aling Nene. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I love her. She said her barbecue is really the best. Oh, that was my um, mom's recipe. No <laughs> zoo animals were harmed in the making of this barbecue, but that kept <laughs> yeah. us fueled every Saturday. Yeah. And we volunteered for, I think, um, three or four. Well, no. Well, yeah, we volunteered for years. My, vo- my dad volunteered to the day he uh, decided to uh, move. To heaven. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. What was the volunteer all about? To clean, to clean Mali, or what? Uh, no, we did educational program. Okay, the, the zoo volunteer group had um, like a different objective. We did education programs. We did animal enrichment. We did zoo tours. We did all of those things. We did zoo to you programs where you would bring some of the animals to schools and teach uh, Filipino children about Philippine wildlife. So this is one of our greatest things. Uh, my dad's uh, part was uh, to keep the elephant entertained. <laughs> and they really had a wonderful relationship. He and Mali what, love at first sight. And really? they had such a special bond. And he would advocate for saving the zoo. And he would really help us. And he would bring... Uh, kids with, they had this other advocacy called Photography with a Difference. And they would bring kids to the zoo and have photography workshops and, you know, all of those things. They would take these kids to fly, to, we, yeah. We, can you imagine now how fun it is growing up in the studio? Mm -hmm. It was amazing. It was an amazing childhood. Yeah, well, until I was 29. You were very privileged. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so uh, in closing, um, you went from, we knew you from when you were, as you said, seven year old, uh, lining up for the melting ice cream and running around in a studio that started uh, small and then started growing and growing because your mom was uh, a closet architect and wanted to expand. And, uh, you know, uh, as the business hey. expanded, she expanded the, the the place, yeah. Nina props to them. They started with 1,000 pesos capital. Really? And a borrowed camera. Mm. Yeah, imagine that. Yeah, see that? And add photo, for those who don't know, is one is probably the biggest um, advertising, commercial advertising studio in, in the Philippines, right? And uh, you were one of the first to shoot cars we were the well yeah we and we shot, uh, one, we of, the, one of the first one, uh, of, the one first, of the yeah, first okay. the earliest to do digital photography yeah right. anyway all right kathy in closing um you have a you you still have a long life to live and um there uh, uh back there in, in uh, Dutch and um, continuing with your culinary DNA, which is evolving, plus that of your husband and your kids uh, being the canning club. How would you, how, how, what, would, what advice would you like to give to the Gen Xers who are listening now, maybe in choosing a career or uh, inviting them to visit uh, what what they can see there in your in your in your adopted country, or um, also in facing a something like a cancer and facing it like how brave the way you bravely faced it. Let's end I, with that. Yeah, I would say always have a dream. I think dreams are important. Because it pushes you through your difficulty. It pushes you through the challenges that you might face. I mean, if you, you have your eye on the prize, so yeah, you'll jump the hurdles that you need to jump to get to where you want to go. Okay. And, you know, for us, you know, with a young family, as long as we're together, we're going to be okay. It doesn't matter where we are. We're going to be fine because we're working together, right? right. And... I think it's all really a matter of how you choose to view yourself. I, I don't feel sorry for me. Mm -hmm. Even if I, like, you know, I'm an MPT, I'm a survivor. Why should I feel sorry for myself? Good. And that is an attitude that reflects mm -hmm. and it reverberates. And you, like I said, right, you, get the energy that you put out into the world. I think the cookies aren't as important as the recognition of, a, of another human being, the, the gratitude for what they do. And that's what they remember. Mm -hmm. It's not, I, I, I don't think it's the particular cookie recipe, really. It's just the act. <laughs> it's Bucket just the list. act of, Right? Bucket list. Give me a bucket list. Uh, for the Philippines? Doesn't matter. I want to eat Aling Nene's barbecue. <laughs> um, I don't have any thing Not yet. on my bucket list. No, mm -hmm. I've done the stuff that I wanted to do. Everything else is a bonus. Um, I want to, yeah, aside from Kambulo, we'll see how it goes. I want to take my kids traveling. I, I want to reach 70. Maybe 80, 90. Why, 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 why bargain for 70? I'm already 70 and I want to live until. Oh, well, you don't. I, I never thought you would admit that online. But us, <laughs> I, I want to travel with my kids. And okay help them see the world and experience different things mm -hmm. okay. that's good all right 
So, um, and last words, any one last line before we say goodbye? And before I, I say that, um, I would like to first say that uh, the Kathy factor became the cookies that reached out and said thank you. And maybe that's one lesson that uh, bakers and chefs and cooks and food, good cooks and foodies can also try. You know, always have a, a box of cookies that you can share rather than handing out money or, you know, um, something else. Cookies is something that from your hand to their their uh, mouths or something, it's already from a your connection. Heart. Yeah, and it's an it's an organic connection, right? Okay, all right. So, so thank you for having me. I am looking thank forward you to seeing you soon. Yeah, well, okay, um, uh, guys in the audience, we are facing somebody who has really been an example of courage and a very positive attitude and um, she she has been uh, very inspiring for us uh, seniors as well as uh, people of her age and Kathy stay like that and keep inspiring and yes travel with your husband and your kids thank you very much for being here you are awesome and this is awesome live and thank you and happy that your culinary DNA is evolving until Thank that's you. until you're 99.9 .9. god bless you thank you very thank much you. Audience, for listening uh, it's another inspiring story and uh, another awesome person that we had here we will always continue to call on inspiring people god bless you bye bye, bye.